Austria was marred by political instability following the collapse of Austria-Hungary. Amidst the turmoil, one man emerged on May 20th, 1932 to chart a course of redemption. Engelbert Dolfus, a devout Catholic, Dolfus championed division rooted in the Christian fervor of the Middle Ages, fervently believing that only such approach could rescue Austria and Europe from the looming perils. Leading the Fatherland Front, Dolfus vociferously preached against the rising tides of neo-paganism, atheism, racism, communism, and the hatred emanating from Germany and the Soviets. Dolfus took drastic measures banning the National Socialists and the Communist parties. On February 12, 1934, a brief but intense civil war broke out between the government and the Communists. Emerging victorious, the Fatherland Front implemented a new constitution grounded in the assertion of God-given human rights. However, Dolfus' efforts faced a tragic end on July 25, 1934, when National Socialists launched the July push to overthrow the government and introduced the malevolence of Germany into Austria. Dolfus, determined to thwart the coup, stayed behind as his cabinet fled. Dolfus was shot in the head by Otto Pomnetta and asked for the Eucharist and last rites, but the Germans refused. The German coup failed as Austria rejected their false promises, but the damage was done. Kurt Schuschnigg assumed leadership, albeit with lesser capabilities and lacking a close alliance with Italy, as Austria's position deteriorated. The inevitable eventually transpired on March 12, 1938, when Germany invaded Austria, imposing the Anschluss and unleashing their tyrannical hatred upon the beleaguered nation. But don't get down, you over 18,000 frontisans and the 90% who haven't subscribed yet. History is forever changed on July 25, 1934, as Dolfus survived when the police recognized the German infiltrators before they reached the Chancellery. The army and police surrounded and stopped the Germans. The Austrian NSDAP leaders immediately were arrested and executed, and the party banned. Dolfus requested aid from Mussolini, who mobilized the army and prepared for war with Germany. The Germans were initially excited about the coup, but were surprised and embarrassed by the debacle. Mussolini's readiness to go to war and the perceived superiority of the Italian army exposed the German leadership's incompetence. This revealed the National Socialists, who had only come to power in 1933, aimed to suppress regional German identities in favor of a neo-pagan, anti-Christian ideology, a stark realization that was warned against by the Fatherland Front. Protests against the regime erupted throughout Germany. The political landscape in France was different as the right-wing government maintained power in 1932 instead of the Radical Socialist Party under Edouard Herriot, causing instability, leading to a mass strike by communists. The military intervened to quell the strikes, and Charles de Gaulle emerged to stabilize the nation, reminiscent of Cincinnatus in ancient Rome. De Gaulle then mobilized the army with ambitions to annex the Rhineland and dissolve Germany, a long-standing goal for France. While the stress of front of France, Italy, and Great Britain, which aimed to counteract Germany and maintain Austrian independence, did not yet exist, these sentiments were prevalent in Europe at the time. Events in France prompted the country to join the Rome Protocols instead, which was a trade and military alliance between Italy, Austria, and Hungary signed on March 17, 1934. Secretly, Poland joined the Rome Protocol, while Great Britain waited and watched. The Second Brothers' War erupted on October 18, 1934, as Italy and Austria invaded Bavaria, exposing the German weakness. They were a paper tiger, as rearmament efforts only began in the past year, being significantly weaker than France, Italy, and Poland at this point. Italy and Austria gained some territory before the front ground to a halt. Simultaneously, France swiftly occupied the Rhineland without encountering any opposition. The remilitarization of the Rhineland historically occurred on March 7, 1936, so there were no German troops stationed there at this point dealing a crippling blow to the German economy and industry. As the French and Italians pushed further into the German heartland, Germany pulled troops from the east. Pilsudski, the Polish leader, mobilized the army and invaded. Poland historically maintained a strong military force, a most comparable in size to Germany, and were battle-hardened from conflicts against the Soviets. Polish forces swiftly advanced, capturing Konigsberg and Lower Silesia, allowing France and Austria to push deeper. In November, the Polish army achieved a monumental victory, taking Berlin. Faced with the overwhelming pressure from multiple fronts, Germany surrendered. The Treaty of Copenhagen reshaped Central Europe. Austria annexed the Catholic southern regions of Germany, who they shared a close cultural connection with, Baden, Württemberg, and Bavaria. Germany itself was dissolved into smaller entities, each under the sway of France. 
Hanover, Westphalia, Brandenburg, and Saxony were formed. France annexed the Saarland and the southern portion of the Rhineland, while Belgium secured a share of the Rhineland, appeasing the British. This was strategically done as there was some French hope to annex Belgium in the future, while there was no chance of ever taking land from the Dutch, so they were not given any land. Poland took East Prussia, Southern Silesia, and integrated Danzig, officially renamed Gdansk, into Poland. An international zone was established at the Kiel Canal, similar to the Dardanelles in Turkey, with Denmark being expanded. Prussian sentiments were angered that no Prussian state was formed, but all participating nations concurred that Prussian militarism had been the primary catalyst for German aggression, reflecting the international consensus that suppressing Prussian influence was essential for long-lasting peace in the region. The brief nature of the war made it appear more as a continuation of the Great War, rather than as a major conflict, similar to the Polish-Soviet War. The war did strengthen ties between Austria, Hungary, Italy, Poland, and France, who quietly abandoned support for the Little Entente, unbeknownst to Czechoslovakia, Romania, and Yugoslavia. Italy's army was now battle-hardened and more focused on Europe, so the Ethiopian invasion was put on hold. The Anglo-German naval treaty was never signed, so positive relations between Italy, the United Kingdom, and France were maintained. The war gave Dolfus time to implement his reforms and policies opposing many of the evil ideologies that had emerged in the 19th and 20th century. The federal state of Austria retained its name. While the new regions maintained some autonomy, new districts were formed to weaken regional identities with a new Austrian one. The Fatherland Front emphasized Austrian nationalism, Catholicism, federalism, corporatism, authoritarian conservatism, and clericalism. Dolfus, influenced by Catholic social doctrine and the encyclical Rerarum Nuverarum, was a fervent anti-capitalist. Corporatism was a key aspect of Dolfus's ideology, rejecting class struggle and seeking to eliminate merchants and international bankers. He aimed to protect his people from international finance and economic exploitation. The Ständestadt implemented laws facilitating the transfer of land to small-scale farmers, encouraging ownership and cultivation. He envisioned a church-state symposium, drawing inspiration from the Byzantine Empire, where religion and state would cooperate on issues without interfering with each other. Guilds and professional associations were supported to foster collaboration between workers and employers, ensuring fair labor conditions and economic stability. They promoted unions, specifically anti-Marxist and pro-Christian trade unions, resembling medieval guilds. Each guild represented a different occupation and held some sway or say in the government. The goal was to prevent exploitation and ensure a fair Christian society. Dolfus rejected the bourgeoisie but supported aristocracy based on merit. The Fatherland Front opposed most monopolies, as foreign nations controlled them, unless they somehow benefited the state and the people. The government was perceived as a unified body, with each part working in harmony for the greater good of everybody in Austria. The prevailing contrast between Catholicism and Darwinism underscored Dolfus's commitment to Catholic principles, which were manifested in the form of the government and society influenced by the social teachings of Pope Pius XI's 1931 encyclical, Quadragissimo Anno. Catholic social teaching formed the cornerstone of Dolphus's policies, emphasizing matters of human dignity and the common good in society. This doctrine addressed oppression, the role of the state, subsidiarity, local organization, concerns for social justice, and issues related to the wealth distribution. Distinctive in its critiques of various ideologies, both left and right, it condemned liberalism, communism, anarchism, feminism, atheism, socialism, fascism, capitalism, and national socialism. Emphasis on human dignity, as outlined in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, guided Dolphus's policies. This included a preferential option for the poor and vulnerable, extending to unborn children, people with disabilities, the elderly, the terminally ill, and victims of injustice and oppression. There were no discriminatory laws against Jews or any races or religions, reflecting Dolphus's belief in equality of all people as children of God. Dolphus also supported Habsburg restoration and reinstated their property, and now had the opportunity to restore them to Austria. Dolfus crowned Otto von Habsburg as a figurehead with no real political powers, similar to the Italian king. This move was apolitical, and tended to act as a unifying force to counteract Darwinian racialism that plagued Europe. Despite the symbolic restoration of the Habsburgs, Dolfus retained full authority over the state. The coronation of Otto was strategically used to pressure Miklos Horthy, who had previously refused to re-accept the Habsburgs, to reinstate the king and fold Hungary under Austria once more. This eventually occurred, and Hungary was federally integrated under Austria in a similar arrangement to Bavaria. Despite this, the Little Entente nations rejected the Habsburg coronation, fearing a potential reintegration into Austria, escalating tensions, 
which was exactly what Dolphus, Hordi, and Mussolini wanted, as they had already agreed to the partition of Yugoslavia in the Rome Protocols originally in 1934. Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia denounced the coronations and mobilized their armies. However, Romania, pressured by Italy, stayed out. The Slavs expected France to step in at this point as a mediator between the two sides to reach some sort of compromise, but political instability within France isolated the Slavs. The War of Austrian Reclamation broke out in 1936 to once again redraw the borders of the old Habsburg Empire. Italy quickly blockaded the Adriatic from Yugoslavia, cutting off trade, while their army seized northern Dalmatia, but the Yugoslavians proved formidable, forcing the Italians and Austrians to a standstill. The Germans in the Sudetenland, alongside the Hungarians in the southeast, broke out in rebellion once the war broke out as they finally had the chance to reunite with their homeland, crippling the Czechoslovak defenses. Germans and Hungarians constituted almost 25% of Czechoslovakia at that time. The Poles saw this as an opportunity to take the rest of Czechian Silesia and the Carpathian Ruthenia, and invaded. Brun and Kassa were taken with ease, but Prague held out until early 1938. Following the fall of Prague, the Czechoslovaks surrendered and were partitioned between Austria and Poland at the Treaty of Liechtenstein. Once Czechoslovakia surrendered, the troops were freed up to move south, and the Serbians realized the war was unwinnable. Despite performing well against the Italian army, they knew they would falter, with Austrians focusing on the south now. Rather than fight a bloody war and be left with a rump Balkan state, they agreed to negotiate with Austria, who also had no desire for a prolonged war. Mussolini already occupied the Italian iridescent lands in Dalmatia and agreed to negotiate as well. The Treaty of Brussels was signed on June 28, 1938, ending the war. Italy received all of their Dalmatian claims, effectively the old Venetian lands. Austria reacquired the remaining Croatian and Slovenian lands alongside the Banat region. Peter I remained as a king, as Yugoslavia was renamed back to Serbia. Serbia kept all remaining lands and agreed to a non-aggression pact with Italy and Austria. As part of the post-war settlement, Horthy was given command of the Austrian navy, finally achieving his dream. The war essentially undid the Treaty of Trianon, but many inside the Austrian government pushed for an invasion of Romania. However, Mussolini forbade any invasion, but troops massed on both sides of the Austrian-Romanian border, forcing Mussolini to act, who quickly negotiated the Florence Award, a settlement between Austria and Romania similar to the historic Second Vienna Award. This saw northern Transylvania, majority Hungarian land, given back to Austria, pacifying the situation. Following the war, Europe had a few short years of peace, allowing all sides to rebuild their nations as it seemed that the dark days of the Great War were long gone. However, one common threat still emerged, threatening European civilization as they knew it. Communism. While all the changes had wars had been fought in the previous decades, the Soviets were busy purging their military, finally ending the purge on November 7th, 1938, when they began to prepare for a red wave that would flood Europe, spreading communism throughout the globe. The common fear brought Italy, Austria, Poland, Romania, Finland, and Japan together for the inevitable war. In 1941, the Russian bear finally awoke, crushing the Baltics, invading Finland and Poland. The Second World War had just begun. Would the Rome Protocol defeat the Soviet plague, or would the communists prove too much? 10,000 likes for a part two. This video is a collaboration with my friend Rewriting History. My video is on what if Dan Schluss occurred in 1934, with the July push succeeding. Comment any video ideas you guys have, and if you want the maps and more, check out my Patreon or become a channel member. Goodbye.